Hey guys, what's up? It's Apollo, and today we've got a very special video. We're going to be talking with Griffin from Armchair Historian. He's working on his second game. It's called Master of Command Prussian Glory. So he was telling me the mechanics of this game, and it just it sounds really cool. So I wanted to make like an interview, kind of like podcast-ish uh, you know, video where you guys can kind of hear what they're working on, what his team's working on, and what to expect from Master of Command Prussian Glory. I'm definitely going to be playing this game because it it sounds really cool. And again, you'll hear everything in this interview. Uh, but yeah, if you do want to wish list the game, be sure to do that because it really does support the game. And by the way, I'm not doing this is not a sponsored video. Griffin did not pay me for this video. This is not charity work or anything like that. I genuinely like well, first off, I like Griffin. He's a cool guy. He's a passionate guy. He has a great channel. Second off, I like his game. Any way that I can help make the game successful is is is, you know, I, I'd be more than happy to help. So anyways, I just wanted to do a short little intro. Uh, let's just go ahead and get this interview started. Thanks for watching, guys. All right, here we are with Griffin, the, or you might know him as the Armchair Historian. Uh, he is making his next game, so second game, Master of Command Prussian Glory. What can you tell us, in a nutshell, what this game is all about? Well, uh, thank you, Apollo, for giving me the chance to talk about the game. Um, our next project is focused on um, 18th century Central Europe. So we're actually scaling down a little bit from the last game where we were trying to take on kind of a broader Victorian theme across multiple continents. This time we're scoping down a little bit. Um, in our last project, I think maybe we had a little bit um, too much ambition trying to take on too many things at once. So for this game, we really stopped to think, um, how can we come up with a very polished, um, very focused experience in a time period that's often not explored as well? So uh, the setting is in the 1750s, so the middle of the 18th century, and it follows Frederick the Great. And he, in many ways, actually um, has a lot of similarities to a Napoleon-like figure. Um, he is attacked on all sides by a large coalition force. He wins big battles against the odds in these kind of grand epic fights. Um, but unlike Napoleon, he rarely gets any coverage. Uh, really, the only coverage you're going to find, either through movies, is a movie maybe like Barry Lyndon, or through a game, maybe a little bit of like Empire Total War kind of crossover. Um, but both of those are very old, and uh, it seems like um, nowadays that kind of setting isn't being covered too much. So I figured this was a great opportunity. Um, it's something new, it's something refreshing. And like I said with Fire Maneuver, we try to bite off a little bit more than we can chew. And this time, I think we're a lot more wiser and we're kind of focusing in a much smaller area um, in order to come up with a very refined um, gameplay system and very refined content. Um, the selling point of this game is actually though on roguelike elements. And unlike many historical strategy games, and in fact, I don't think I could name a single historical strategy game that takes on the roguelike genre, um, we're letting this, uh, we're letting the player fight their version of the Seven Years were different every single time they play. Um, so we're going with kind of a unique theme this time that's not often covered, and we're trying to put a unique spin on the um, kind of the core gameplay experience um, as we're kind of focusing in on this area. Um, the only thing that I can think of in terms of strategy roguelike is um, Darkest Dungeon. But that's totally, that's a turn-based single, you know, that's totally different. Yeah, we're, we're trying to combine the historical side of things. So games like Darkest Dungeon, um, Faster Than Light, Spelunky, all those kind of games um, focus on either like turn-based combat or more arcade-based combat, um, or certainly tackle fantasy themes almost exclusively, you'll notice. Um, and so we're trying to bridge this kind of like um, historical Total War style experience with a whole new genre that I don't believe it's ever had that kind of level of crossover with, um, which I believe in many ways is going to appeal to both of those crowds. If you're a fan of um, Total War battles and that real-time exciting um, kind of like army management and fighting these large epic battles in a unique his um, historical theme, and if you like just really smart gameplay systems um, that, uh, you know, the gameplay loop is very clearly defined, um, then I think both of those kind of crowds are, are going to enjoy it. No, I agree. I what I so that this actually I was really when you were showing me your your game, I was actually I was like, wow, this is a great idea. This rogue element because it kind of cuts the fat of a hefty campaign where you know where people usually like in a total war campaign, you're almost like God, you know, like you're telling what to build, you're managing cities. This you're a general. And you've been, basically you've been told 
to achieve a mission, take a territory. And I think this is perfect for the roguelike because you'll play it a ton of times and you'll come across different challenges just like in real life when we hear about all these military campaigns, we have all these different obstacles that the commander had to overcome and the army had to overcome. Is that essentially like what you're going for with this? Yeah, that's a great point. So I think um, the roguelike genre helps immerse you in that kind of general's perspective um, because Frederick the Great, this the Seven Years' War, for the most part, is one of his first like large-scale military um, endeavors. Now, there are multiple Silesian Wars, and we're covering pretty much mostly the second one, but though there's kind of spillover. Um, but as a general, um, he's not rehearsing his battles over and over again. When you play um, other historical games, you might be rehearsing certain historical scenarios or trying to reuse historical tactics. And there is fun to that, um, especially games like Ultimate General or Total War, they have those historical battles. You can go to those famous sites. In this case, we're really leaning into the random generation. That's not to say random generation as in big, empty areas that aren't handcrafted, um, which can be a pitfall of a lot of randomly generated games. Um, but uh, we really want to give the player the feeling that you're on this campaign trail, you might be going to Silesia, and this time the rivers look a little bit different, um, and the roads are curving in a different way, and the positions of the enemies are in different areas. You can't recreate, um, if you read the book on Frederick the Great, you can't necessarily pull exactly, you could follow in his footsteps about how he approached situations from a strategic um, perspective, but you can't just copy what he did. And I, I find that by its very nature, historical games can sometimes run into that issue where you might be following in the exact footsteps um, and just trying to recreate historical strategies. Like I said, there's some fun to that, but I think that's the unique thing that our game is trying to do is your Seven Years' War experience is different every single time, from the enemies you encounter to the very terrain of the campaign map. So unlike um, a civilization or a total war or that sort of thing, when you load in um, and you decide to go campaigning in Saxony, for example, um, the way that that terrain is generated for you to move those troops around and engage in battles or go to villages and recruit troops and that sort of thing, um, that's going to be a completely different layout every single time. Um, and so you need to um, adapt and you have to improvise every single time. Uh, there is no relying on routines or, you know, for example, I'll, I'll fire up a strategy game and I'll do my 10th playthrough as the same country and I'm following those same kind of... And again, there is fun to it because you can refine that playthrough and you've got it down to be a perfectionist. But the one issue I have that I believe we're solving in some ways um, is the diffi difficulty curve in a lot of nation building games, which are fun, I love those games, um, is that at the very start, you have maybe one province or one territory. So the difficulty is very high from the very start. And you might be new at this game as well. However, once you start conquering and you get bigger and more experienced, the game actually gets easier. So it's a little bit um, inverted than what you'd think. You would imagine as you get more experienced and you've got a bigger, um, better control over the game, you'd get bigger and bigger challenges. But think of how many strategy games you've played where once you've got that snowball going, once your country is large enough, once the empire is built massively, what's to stop you? And in fact, you might be quitting or ending most of those games out of boredom, not because of a great challenge. I believe in our game, again, the scope is smaller, so we're not trying to sell you on something so large and so grandiose, a big open world. Um, we're not going to overpromise and underdeliver that sort of open experience. Um, maybe one day, if we continue making games, and that's something I would love to do. But for this kind of project, we really wanted to dial in the scope and come up with a really fun gameplay loop. The loop and the difficulty curve and your engagement as a player is essential. Um, often people can overlook, they're just thinking, oh, the historical theme on its own will sell the game. But for us, the historical theme is one thing, but also really keeping you engaged and having a really tight gameplay loop and wanting you to keep building your army to encounter bigger and bigger challenges. You know, why is it the case that in arcade games, um, or really any other genre, you have boss battles, you have something to perfect, like a Dark Souls, where you approach this impossible enemy. You might have to try it a few times to go um, to beat it. But in historical games, often, the boss is your early difficult start as you build up your empire, and at that point, the challenges kind of fade away. Um, and in our game, every time you go to conquer a region, the next region's harder. There's more enemies, they're, they're more difficult. Um, all the while you are managing logistics, ammunition, the troops under your command. As you mentioned, we really want to immerse the player as a general. So all of the mechanics have been built around being a general. Um, and we can get into this a little bit later, but managing your army, customizing your troops, recruiting new men, equipping them with individual items, not just muskets or bayonets, but even the very cartridge pouch that a, a regiment is equipped with, that's all under your control. You as a general are um, 
being put essentially in the situation that a Frederick the Great would, where you have to manage your divisional officers and your troops, and are you keeping them uh, fed and equipped? Um, those are questions often not uh, brought up in historical strategy games, where it's often build a stack of troops, throw them in. If you lose them, it doesn't matter. Raise another stack. In our game, you have this one army. And for those who are unfamiliar with the roguelike genre, the, there are two things that make a game a roguelike. Some people debate it, but the two most essential things are permanent death and random generation. Those are two fundamental parts of our game, which again are often explored in uh, historical games. In a historical game, you can throw an army out, it gets killed, it doesn't matter. And also in historical games, you can go conquer the same region a hundred times, it'll look mostly the same, and it'll feel mostly the same. So we're trying to solve those two, what I find to be deficiencies in some cases, for how historical games approach um, that kind of gameplay loop and that kind of theme. So that's kind of our unique spin on the gameplay. Uh, and like I said, we're not trying to overpromise this giant open world. Maybe one day we can get to that kind of scale, but we're really trying to give a player a memorable um, and interesting experience that's unique, just, just not something you've really ever experienced in a historical strategy game. Yeah, and I don't think large scale equals amazing all the time. So it's nice to, to see a more detailed small scale event. What I want to hear a little bit of, because a lot of a roguelike, there's a lot of balancing. There's a balance of taking a certain path that might get you some good gear, but it's going to take you more time, which makes the enemy stronger. Or you could take the path of, well, this is going to be re really tough, but the enemy will be weaker when I get to the main battle. What are some things in your game that you're planning to implement of options, paths, choices that you as a general can take to overcome your opponent? Yeah, so I find that I think there's a flaw in some uh, roguelike games, but mostly in the historical genre, that your if you have like nodes or tiles, it can often feel more like a mission selector than it does an actual route that you're carving out to get to a destination. We really want to lean into that, where you're building a trail, essentially, to get to an enemy force. How the game works is once you select a region to begin campaigning in as a general, um, and that map generates, you've got an enemy headquarters positioned somewhere on that map. And that's for you to go and meet the enemy in a large pitch battle. That's going to be your big climactic boss battle, so to speak, where the enemy is going to be the hardest and the biggest you've seen at, up to that point. Um, so, so everything you're doing on that campaign trail is in preparation. It's all in, in anticipation for that battle. Now, we give the players the choice to rush through the, the quickest path, um, something like you mentioned, uh, where they can just immediately rush um, to that battle. If they do that, however, they're missing out on all of the other areas they could be campaigning in. And you may ask, what's the point of going to other areas? Isn't it just like open ground? But in our um, campaign maps, you've got little villages. Um, those villages may even have little encounters or, or quests in, in some uh, way for you to do. Um, there may be an encounter that says, uh, hey, there's a small enemy force up ahead. If you pay us off, we can go distract them and you've got a whole new path open for you to move through. So those are kind of, again, I, I want the player to feel like they're improvising. There's... Um, I think it was Moltke who said, uh, no plan survives its first encounter. So if you plan this nice elaborate path to go through on that campaign map, but you start, um, maybe you stumble on an enemy supply depot, or maybe an event pops up and it halts your path, or maybe you find an enemy position holding a bridge and you don't want to do a river crossing battle. All of that terrain, all of those kind of encounters will play a role. So it's not just a glorified mission selector. That's not what this, uh, that's not what our campaign map will look like. The terrain you cross through, you could even try to cross through mountains. If you do that, that enemy headquarters, which you're after, is going to actually slow its growth rate. Just to give you some further context, the longer you're campaigning, that enemy headquarters is building up because they see that you're there. They're, they're building up their forces too. So it's also about kind of concealment. If you cut through a forest, think of like Hannibal. He's Hannibal's moving through um, the mountains and descending um, into Italy uh, from a path they thought impossible and getting the surprise on, on the enemy headquarters and fighting the Romans in a pitch battle um, or uh, taking out villages and taking them completely by surprise. So those are kind of strategies you can... These aren't programmed in. These aren't um, specific events you have to follow. These are natural things you can do as a player. If you decide that you need to take a shortcut or you, need, or you decide there's a large mountain pass and you have extra supplies, you have extra provisions to get through that difficult journey, you could decide to cut through that path. You might be missing out on other certain encounters, um, but it may take you to that enemy camp before they're even able to build up. They lost track of you, so they stopped reinforcing. So the way, the pacing you move on this map, the the areas that you visit, the terrain that you encounter, um, all of these things matter. And again, all of the mechanics serve to make you feel like a general on that map. I don't want a glorified mission selector. I don't want a glorified map painter. That's not what we're setting out to do. I wanted to take the design of this game all the way to the beginning and not use all my preconceptions of what a historical strategy game has to be. I wanted to just play all the best games I could find and um, take mechanics I really liked that just 
were very well thought out and adapt them and change them and try to build them into a historical theme, which I find works actually quite well. As a general, there is no rehearsal. There's no rehearsal that you've played in the same region 10 times and you know what to expect. Um, every time you're going in, you don't know what to expect and you have to adapt. When you're going to villages and towns, these aren't areas, you aren't uh, um, a governor. Uh, you're not a mayor. You don't own these towns necessarily. You may pass through them, and if it's a, if you're a Prussian king, if you're the Prussian king and you move through a Prussian town, you may find there are regiments to be levied to add to your army. You don't get to select and put them in training queues. Um, you may be moving through a small village, and they say, "Hey, we have some volunteers who you can add into your army." Um, so you may bring on those volunteers um, and take them with you for the rest of that campaign. Unlike uh, other games as well, uh, you aren't just deleting troops as well um, once they've. Be once they become outdated. You know, as you're moving through and the, and the game's becoming more challenges, it's not a matter of deleting old troops and raising stacks of new ones. Uh, we also want to build this attachment to your one single army. So uh, your troops, sort of like a Mountain Blade type of game, have their own little upgrade trees as they gain veterancy. You could take these lowly recruits who had no experience at all, and through sticking with you in every fight and holding the line and doing performing these glorious actions in battle, you could find that they're gaining such amount of veterancy that you could reform these men into a grenadier regiment. And in fact, you could go visit a town and find a brand new cartridge box or a, a new pack of grenades to equip them. Like I said, you're not putting troops into production and you're not putting items into production. So what you stumble upon is what you find. Um, and in that way, you have to adapt just like a real general. You might find a supply depot or a certain village that has access of some, um, something um, and you're gonna build and change that composition around that. So there's no such thing as going into the war thinking you're only going to build a, a cavalry-based force. If you happen to go through your first campaign, there's no horses in that region. Maybe those horses um, were already recruited by the enemy, or the, or the explanation is all the horses um, died or were uh, set off, or there could be any number of explanations. You can't go in with that preconceived idea of what you're going to build until you stumble upon it. And that's something that I really like in games that force you to adapt, and you can't just follow the same routine every time. It makes it gives you a reason to play it a few more times, because you're thinking, oh, what if I tried it this time and I find something different that builds, that I end up with a totally different force? Um, we have got rosters of over 30 unique units for every country in the game. So right now we're just starting with three countries, but we've given all of those countries, all these unique units and uniforms and elite regiments and all the Totenkopf Hussars and all these kind of guys that you can encounter. It's also funny, you mentioned like that you were excited for the customization. So many games neglect that, but the 18th century and even in, through the Napoleonic Wars is like the fashion, the military fashion century where every uniform is spectacular and bright and colorful and unique. Um, and that's something that we definitely want to model in this game. We're not um, we're not going to be recoloring the same line infantry for each unit. You know, they all have their own kind of special look to them. Um, that's something that's really important to me as well. I definitely want to start talking about the customization. Um, and so what exact? So let's start with um, army structure. How are the armies going to be structured in your game? Yeah. So instead of just having a big um, pool to just throw all your regiments in, you have these um, predefined divisions um, that you can fill up. Um, I think the maximum is about five divisions. Each division is also led by an officer. And just like uh, go, stumbling on a town and finding a regiment to levy, you may actually stumble on a town and find a, an officer to bring into your force. Um, those officers also have their own backgrounds and traits too. So you can kind of evaluate, um, oh, this, this officer's a mathematician. That's gonna give him plus 10% when he's handling artillery. Um, I don't want to bring him in because I don't have any art artillery in my army, and I didn't find any artillery yet, so I'm going to skip on that officer. Um, or maybe I want to get him because I think the next town I visit, it's got to have artillery. I, I haven't seen it in so long. It's got to be there, so I'm going to get him in anticipation for that. Um, so that's the kind of officer level management you can do. Those officers also have skill trees, so it's not entirely up to their background. You can also mold them through experience. They need to kind of level up through experience in battle, and you can kind of mold them into um, how you want them to perform and how you want them to manage. Otherwise, uh, these divisions can be filled up, I think, by about four or five regiments. And those regiments are going to receive the buffs from that officer. So it really does actually manage, uh, matter how you structure those regiments in which division that they're in. There may be an officer that, that actually comes with a pro and con. Maybe there's an Austrian officer who hates the Hungarians, or a Hungarian officer who doesn't speak any German. He doesn't um, he does not mesh well with German-speaking troops. And so if you're playing as the uh, Austrians, you have to segregate <laughs> your Hungarians and your Austrians because the officers just can't command that well otherwise. So there are a lot of little considerations you're making um, between those regiments, who's leading them, what they have, what they specialize in, um, and then how you're kind of forming the synergies, to use that term again, with the officers and the regiments themselves. Um, one thing we are experimenting with, one last thing I'll just add to it, this is not confirmed just yet, but I think it would be cool if um, regiments gained combat fatigue and if you put them in battle and they're taking heavy losses over and over and over again, that those troops 
um, are going to suffer that kind of combat fatigue, and they have a higher risk of developing more negative traits or more kind of like negative attributes associated with them. So you, you, we will have, this part is um, confirmed, we're going to have like a reserve section, so you can put certain regiments or certain officers in reserve if you want to give them a break. Um, the whole combat fatigue I'm on the fence about adding yet, I don't want to add too much, um, but that was a cool idea I think that could really play into those systems. So it is possible you could have like a general that is like god tier melee charging, but total garbage tier gun management. Yes, that's right. I mean, it's also not realistic. It gives so much more personality to a general if he's got this laughably bad part of his command um, or like the way he leads, but then there's something amazing he can also do. Um, imagine a trait, and this is something I've already got planned. Imagine a trait that says an officer um, has 50% more likelihood of being killed in battle because you actually have to attach an officer to a unit. What is cool too, just as a, not to veer off too much, but instead of having a bunch of little generals running around the map, and you've got to keep moving them around and they don't do anything, you just attach them to a regiment and it takes care of the rest. So you're not over microing all, it's not like heroes in Warhammer uh, where you're moving around all these little generals as in individual entities. Um, instead, we just stick them with the regiments. If those regiments are in the front line of combat, or let's say you have a cavalry division and the officer leading the cavalry is in the front of that charge, Cannonball comes in, wipes the officer out. Everybody in that area could be devastated that they just lost their officer. But imagine a or trait happy. that says, <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Imagine an officer who um, has a 50% chance of dying more often, but also gives like plus 25% melee. So you want to use him in close combat, but anytime you do, you're risking his life. So he's like this really um, energetic figure who just gets himself. He's like a, a soldier's officer who um, just gets himself into uh, combat and just goes wild. Um, that Those kind of things could be fun because I like playing around those kind of malices. I don't enjoy when everything becomes... This is part of the difficulty curve I was mentioning too, everything just becomes so powerful and so insanely strong. Um, and that can be fun in some cases, but I just, I, I think it's just more dynamic and it adds a bit more humanity to it when certain units or certain officers have certain drawbacks and you're playing around those things and maximizing their benefits. And that to me is more fun. And one last thing with, about the army customization, you mentioned earlier that you can customize the flag and uh, you it's kind of like you can build almost a regimental culture around different regiments if they achieve like a really great maneuver or they, they did something glorious or the other way around. I think you mentioned this, that the uniforms will change color based upon their flags. This is not a rule. Anybody who likes history is, is gonna know kind of where, where I'm going with this, but this is not a rule um, uh, in all militaries at the time. Although we're making it a rule just because it's fun. Um, but typically your regiment, you carry two flags into battle, sometimes more, sometimes less. Again, it depends on the country, but you typically have like your king's color. So it's like more of the national flag or more something that every regiment is going to carry. And then you have your regimental flag, um, and that is specific to that regiment. Um, and those regimental flags, uh, the British Army is a great example. You'll notice they have all these different colors in use, and that color almost always pertains to the facings, which are the cuffs and the collars on the uniforms of those men. Um, in the case of the Prussian Army, you have uh, troops wearing literally pink collars and cuffs. Um, Austria did it too. Um, I don't believe the Russians did. I don't believe the Russians changed their, their um, facings until the Napoleonic Wars, but we're still, we're still going to do it just because I think it's fun. Um, if you want to play historically, though, then just make all of the um, facing colors red, keep them red, and, and you can play. So I think what is cool about it is you can play a historic or you can play historically. That is cool. Um, but yeah, if you edit um, that regimental flag, um, it just edits the facing. So I do not want to allow the player to like go in with a pink jacket or like a um, like they're, all their troops are goth looking. They've got all these black jackets on or something, you know? Um, so the jacket colors will be predefined. They've got to say the way they are. Um, of course, we have these predefined regiment types that you can hire, um, but those little collars and cuffs, the little details will get altered based on the, um, the secondary flag color that you choose. You can choose a primary. Uh, you've got two colors you can choose, a primary and a secondary color on the flag. The secondary is going to determine the facings. The primary um, is just for looks. And then you also have the style. So you'll, you'll notice a lot of Prussian or... Um, Russian or Austrian regimental flags, even the Austrian specifically had a Hungarian style and an Austrian style um, or German style uh, flag pattern. So you can alter those patterns however you want. And I think that's pretty cool too. So it's, you can create your own organizational systems, which is nice. Even flags to you could represent certain things. If you want to remember your melee troops, just give them a red um, secondary color on their flags. And now when you eyeball the map, you can just tell where your melee troops are. So that's kind of fun. You can create your own um, like color coding if you want to, or just make it rainbow or keep it all uniform, anything you you really want to do okay so i know uh we've been talking for a while and i think the big concern or the big interest here that a lot of people are going to have are battles how exactly are you going to approach battles because i know in your first game it was turn base this one you want to make it real time correct yeah so we've started from scratch on this project 
um, which has pros and cons to it. I think there are more pros though. This project, we said, you know what? Let's start with a clean slate. The battle system, I can't tell, I can't talk to you too much about it yet because um, one thing I was saying um, in another conversation was just that the campaign mechanic, the campaign is just built off of mechanics. Um, you have interesting um, mechanics you are interacting with and that's what makes the, uh, the campaign special. The battle system, you don't want a ton of, you don't want like all these drop down menus and a bunch of little stuff. You just want to feel it out. You want to feel like your volleys are punchy and your artillery is doing something. Um, those are kind of things that shape up as the game um, develops further that we just feel out. I think that's that's honestly the best thing you can do. You don't want to over plan a battle system. You want it to feel, that's kind of why we're choosing the, the uh, real time free form movement. We want it to just feel it out and make it feel good and punchy and that regiments feel responsive. One thing I will say is something that, um, a mindset that I'm going into is I like realistic battles, I like longer battles, but I also don't like when realism is taken to such an extreme that it makes things more frustrating than they are fun. So my thing is find, push realism as hard as you can at which point, um, or, or to a point that it does not hurt the fun factor of the game. So I like when battles last a little longer. I like when, so something that we've implemented is fatigue rates. Guys will get more fatigued and they will get more tired and just be less efficient. So you may actually wanna pull guys off the front line and replace them with reserves. But if there are, if fatigue got so important, if fatigue kept going down all the time and we had a little button for you to drink your canteens, all these little details, you know, you don't wanna add so many mechanics, you just want it to feel good. So we're just trying to find that balance right now between I want something that feels impactful, I want battles to feel exciting and unique in some ways, but I don't wanna overload it with all these little um, choices that you have to make. Um, there are some unique things that I will just speak on, like, for example, those officers I mentioned, they can get active abilities that help rally troops around them or inspire them or maybe intimidate the enemy. These are things you might be familiar with with Total War games, uh, but you've got all these different officers that you can kind of customize, which is fun. Otherwise, uh, besides that, uh, some other buttons that we're including are um, dedicated formation buttons. So something I don't think in any of these linear warfare games, maybe Grand Tactician has this, um, but you can form, you can decide to actually form columns or form lines or form square or any, um, or even uh, open order formations. You can spread troops out um, and you'll see them perform those drills in real time and they have their own pros and cons. Um, so it is cool. I like, I always role play when I play Total War and got, move guys in columns because I think it looks cooler. Well, we'll actually make that do something. You know, it's a, it's a, um, it wastes less fatigue and it's easier to maneuver troops around if you move them in columns. So you may deploy troops in more agile formations and then form your battle lines. Um, and then I'll actually touch a bit about, about um, how that relates to our AI. Um, so the AI we're working on, we have a developer who's almost his entire job is AI, which is really cool. Um, he is working on our map editor system, which is not going to be public, but we're building it in such a way that it could be one day, which is cool. The fire maneuver map editor was never meant to be built into a public system. There are a lot of uh, foundational things in that game that we just couldn't build on, unfortunately. So this one, again, with that clean slate comes all those benefits of like, hey, if we build a map editor this time, let's build it so eventually we can make it its own software and people can build their own battlefields. Um, that may come after this game or who knows, but at least it's being built with that in mind. Um, same thing for modding. We're not going to launch with it, but things are now set up with a foundation that it could happen. Something that we've just accomplished that I really like is our AI developer was showing us um, our AI's got this nice little Terminator vision where it's kind of like, it's drawing lines in real time. It's drawing, it's recognizing where the units are. It's grouping them. So it might see that you're clustering cavalry in one particular area. It's going to draw um, its own dynamic lines in real time to that. And then it's going to um, immediately perform a... Um, a strength evaluation of those troops within that grouping and then try to respond with something that is equal or greater than um, that force that you have. And because there are lines drawn around that group, it knows exactly where it should form up in a battle line. So something massively that you'll notice in like a lot of old linear warfare games that you've played is the enemy's never forming battle lines. They're always grouping up or I'll find sometimes they form the battle line. One guy uh, shifts a little bit, everybody down the line starts shifting and then they all start running forward and they just collide into a big melee and that's not good. So when the AI, it achieves multiple things, the AI can actually determine your strength if you're flanking, what you're going to do, if it needs to move some guys over because it sees, ca how many times have you played a Total War game, and the first thing you do is you grab the cavalry, move it around, distract the enemy, and charge their artillery, and the can cannons are gone every single battle you play. Well, this time they can see what you're doing. They can try to detach one of their own pieces and form those lines necessary to meet that. Um, so that's really exciting. AI is like, we don't have a campaign AI necessarily, right? Because you don't have diplomacy, you don't have big countries, we don't have a big open world. And this might seem like a bad thing at first, but if we've got all, if we've got months and months worth of AI developing time that would have been spent there, it can now be put on the battle system. And if the campaign system can run without needing complex AI and still offer a really meaningful challenge and have engaging mechanics, the battle AI can um, shine as a result of that. For the first time, you know, compared to our last game, we're actually ahead of schedule in like all of our ways and we're 
basically producing this game at two times the speed and half the cost. Um, and that's not because we're cutting corners. We're just so much smarter about how we're approaching it. So I'm just really excited with uh, how things are going. And because we started from scratch, all those new foundations that we can build um, from everything we learned from our previous game. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy about that. Well, this this is all really exciting. I'm I'm honestly really impressed with with your ideas here with this game i think it's unique i think it's interesting and i i really cannot wait to, to give it a try um for anyone uh for the viewers if 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 there's any way they can follow the, the development or support in any way so the biggest way to assist is the um uh wish listing the steam page it doesn't cost anything to do that if you just have a steam account and wish list it and that helps a ton because steam pushes things it's kind of like hitting the like button and, and subscribing or that sort of thing it just pushes it out to the algorithm but even more on steam because those wish lists are going to give out notifications and the more wish lists are the more it's going to feature it and then it's going to get even more so that's super super helpful and it's completely free to do the other way if you want to more directly support us is we have a patreon page i'm not going to push it too hard um we have everything funded uh we still have some residuals from our last game coming in um so we're not under like huge constraints financially but if you want to support the game all of that money goes straight into the development we could po possibly add even more um if we can get enough um, support there um and anybody who's paying for those higher tiers are just going to get a key to the game as well um and some of them will even be able to play early as well uh so that's cool i think i am i can't confirm this yet but i think i am planning for that highest tier to even get access to our development server and you can just ask me questions or you know when i'm there in, in the workday, you can maybe like just write something in I think that would be cool. So we're building a community too. We have a public Discord, um, which you can join uh, as well. And I'll probably send you some of these links and uh, people can check it out if they want to. Yeah, I'll have all links in the video description. So if you guys, again, biggest thing you can do guys, and it's totally free is hit the wish, uh, the wish list because that, uh, honestly that is huge i hear this all the time for from indie developers that is huge on steam all right well griffin thank you so much for uh you know getting on and explaining the game uh what's the eta for this i know this is always tough i would say if we're making the progress we are now which has been really incredible it would be done by the end of this year because we're not, it's a small scale game we're not we're, this is not going to be an expensive giant project i'm trying to sell everybody on it's just a fun core experience um, so it could be done by the very end of this year, uh, but worst case, I would think maybe like quarter one of next year if we want to play it safe, because I'm in no need to rush this one. We just want to get it done when it gets done. Uh, that's that's going to be it for t uh, this little insight into your game. If you guys watching have any questions, feel free to like leave some comments. But yeah, that's that's it for me. So we'll see you guys next time. Thank you.